Okay, so today we're going to be discussing Moren of uh, first section, chapter 51. And the topic of our discussion today is God's unity and his lack of attributes. We had begun this discussion uh, already uh, last week in chapter 50. There is, we have begun, we have embarked now on a whole series of chapters which is describing the Rambam's negative theology. Sometimes in uh, philosophical books, you might this might be called apophatic theology, which is essentially basically saying what God is not, instead of saying what God is. The Rambam is going to take the position that the, uh, we, sif- we simply lack uh, sufficient language uh, for the human mind to be able to express into words what God actually is. We had seen the Rambam begin this discussion in chapter 50, where he essentially told us that language will fail us in, in accurately describing God, but that does not mean that it is impossible for us to conceive of something that language cannot express, which in itself is a novelty, because we're always used to thinking that if it's something that I can conceive of, then I can express it in, in, into words. But the Rambam is of the opinion that there are certain metaphysical concepts that cannot be uh, translated into language, but that a person can still find within his own intellect and can conjure the intellectual idea without being able to express it uh, in, into words. In today's chapter, the Rambam is going to emphasize another idea about language in that sometimes language can be misused uh, to try and describe something that is, an, an, that is a logical impossibility. And we're going to get to that idea as well, but the, really the main thrust of this chapter is to embark on this discussion of God lacking uh, attributes, because attributes, if we were to suggest that God possesses attributes, this would negate the, the most important definition of God, which is his absolute unity. Now, this is, a, this is a larger discussion that perhaps we might engage in at, at some later point, which is, why is it that for the Rambam, unity is the most important attribute for God? Um, and I believe that there are a number of reasons for this. Both, number one, we have to remember that the Rambam, first and foremost, is a philosopher, uh, at least in the persona that he presents us with in the Moren of Uchim, and philosophically, the most perfect being is the most unitary being. And because God is absolute perfection, God is also absolute unity. It's also worth noting that the Rambam is certainly a product of the philosophical milieu in which he lives, which is an Islamic philosophical milieu. And writers like Avicenna and so many others that came before the Rambam in that milieu uh, were emphatic about reconciling uh, Greek philosophy with the Islamic faith, and one of the cornerstones of the Islamic faith is God's absolute unity, and it's, there's a tremendous emphasis on that, and that may have also affected the Rambam's uh, emphasis of this idea as well. But let's, but let's take a look and see how he deals with language. Again, in our chapter, chapter 51, we're using the Shlomo Pines edition. We are broadcasting from webyeshiva.org, uh, and if you'd like the handout for today, there are no psukim, there are no verses from Tanakh today, but there are basically just three encyclopedia entries that I have uh, photocopied and cut and paste on this sheet today. You can open up another tab in your browser and go to the Facebook group Shi'ur in Moren Evuchim, and you can easily download the PDF. So the text begins as follows, and we may need to, uh, to translate a lot of things from English into a little bit simpler English. There are many things in existence that are clear and manifest, primary intelligibles and things perceived by the senses. Now, uh, what the Rambam means by primary intelligibles are uh, uh, things that, it, in, in Hebrew, the, the term is muskalot rishonot, things that are basic logical axioms that the mind thinks in a certain way. So, for example, if I were to tell you the whole is always larger than its constituent parts, do I need to prove that to you? No, that's a muskal rishon, that's a basic logical axiom. 
Do I need to prove to you that 2 plus 2 equals 4? No, that's a basic logical axiom once I know the basic principles of uh, arithmetic. So there are certain things that don't require us to prove because they are clear and manifest, they are self-evident. Things that are perceived by the senses are, are self-evident, and I don't need to have to prove them. And in addition, things that come near to these in respect to their clarity, sort of corollaries of axiomatic truths. Uh, things that which, uh, you know, uh, 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 what we would call in Hebrew, in Hebrew, muskalot shniot, secondary intelligibles, things that are offshoots. Once I know that 2 plus 2 is equal to 4, I can go into larger numbers and have offshoots of those logical axioms. If man had been left as he naturally is, uh, meaning without any external efforts to educate him, and to try to indoctrinate him into certain ideologies, he would not have needed a proof for any of these things. For instance, for the existence of motion, the existence of man's ability to act, the manifestations of generation and corruption, that thing come in, come, things come into being and things degrade over time, the natures of the things that are apparent to the senses, like the hotness of fire, the coldness of water, and many other things of this kind. These are all subjects that are discussed in Greek philosophy and are the subject of much speculation, but the Rambam wants to start us off by saying that you don't need it to be a philosopher in order to know that these things are true. But there are strange opinions, meaning different ideologies that crop up uh, over the course of world history that arise due either to people who commit errors or to people who act with some end in view so that professing such opinion, they ran counter to the nature of existence and denied a sensibly perceived thing or wished to suggest to the estimative faculty the existence of a non-existent thing. So you may have ideologies. You may have people who, who wish to suggest, let's say, for example, that everything we see it as it is today has always existed eternally without any new generation or corruption. You may wish to, you may find some people who may tell you that uh, one is not equal to one, but one is equal to three. What I mean by that is a Trinitarian doctrine, which, uh, which suggests that it's possible for God to be three when he's really one, or one when he's really three. And the Rambam needs to show you that these are ideas that are coming from outside of our, of our uh, perfectly capable mental faculties that when we, at first glance, when we think of these things, it's impossible for three to be one and one to be three, and yet people may try to indoctrinate you with certain ideas that you thought were self-evident, and they tell you, no, it's not self-evident, and therefore they're going to try to dissuade you from thinking from things that are already uh, uh, patently obvious to you. And therefore the men of science, meaning philosophers, have had to resort to prove those manifest things and to disprove the existence of things that are only thought to exist. And that's the reason why, he says, we find that Aristotle establishes the fact of motion as it had been denied, and demonstrates the non-existence of atoms as their existence had been asserted. And here we're going to smile a little bit when we hear the, the Rambam say this, because what the Rambam has just stated is that Aristotle, who for the Rambam is the most accurate of all philosophers, in depicting absolute truth of the way the world runs, the physics of the world, Aristotle had to prove certain things that are, are patently obvious. And he didn't have to prove it were it not for the fact that other, ideology, uh, other uh, ideologists, other people, ideologues, who c came along and said, no, uh, it, it's not the way you think that is so obvious, but it's just the opposite. And the two examples that he brings are is that there are people who had strange ideas about the laws of motion. And that's why Aristotle had to give a whole treatise on the rules of motion. And there are also people who denied the existence, uh, who, who claimed that there exist atoms that are small particles of matter that make up everything that exists. And Aristotle, and, and, and even though that's, it's self-evident that that's not true, uh, Aristotle nonetheless had to prove it. So, what the, what the Rambam is making reference to is the philosophical sp school of atomism, and I have the, um, I have the, uh, the encyclopedia entry here in number one of our, of our sheets for today. Atomism is a natural philosophy.
proposing that the physical world is composed of fundamental, indivisible components known as atoms. References to the concept of atomism and its atoms appeared in both ancient Greek and ancient Indian philosophical traditions. And it goes on and describes. Now, this is not the theory, uh, this is not atomic, modern atomic theory. Uh, this is ancient atomic theory, where the, the, everything that exists is made up of a, a, an infinite variety of different shapes and sizes of atoms that make up different types of matter. It's not really important for us to, uh, to go into this theory of atomism right now, but the, the encyclopedia entry continues as follows. Sometimes before 330, before the Common Era, Aristotle asserted that the elements of fire, air, earth, and water were not made of atoms, but were continuous. Aristotle considered the existence of a void, which was required by atomic theories to violate physical principles. Change took place not by the rearrangement of atoms to make new structures, but by transformation of matter from what it was in potential to a new actuality. So he gives an example. A piece of wet clay, when acted upon by a potter, takes on its potential to be an actual drinking mug. And as the entry can continues, Aristotle has often been criticized for rejecting atomism, but in ancient Greece, the atomic theories of Democritus remained pure speculations, incapable of being put to any experimental test. Granted that, it, that atomism was, in the long run, to prove far more fruitful than any qualitative theory of matter, in the short run, the theory that Aristotle proposed must have seemed, in some respects, more promising. And that's certainly the way the Rambam views it. So uh, it, the Rambam lives over, you know, a, a dozen centuries after Aristotle, and therefore takes Aristotle's scientific theory as gospel, if you'll, uh, if you'll excuse the metaphor, and, and therefore says, e Aristotle is self-evident. Obviously, that's the way we think, that there's no such thing as atoms. But nonetheless, Aristotle had to prove it because there are ideologues and scientists who try to argue to the contrary. Now, to this category of things which are self-evident belongs the denial of essential attributes to God, may he be exalted. Now, the Rambam is essentially suggesting that it is self-evident, and it should not be necessary for us to prove that God has no essential attributes, this theory of this negative uh, theology of God, right? And he's, but, but I need to prove it to you, and I need to spend time on proving this to you, because there are those who suggest that God does possess attributes, and certainly, when we look at the text of Tanakh, it is going to certainly seem to be that way as well. For that denial is a primary intelligible, inasmuch as an attribute is not the essence of the thing of which it is predicated, but is a certain mode of the essence, and hence an accident. And essentially, what that means is, is that any time you say that something has an attribute, you're suggesting that that, that attribute is non-intrinsic. It means it is something that is separate from the intrinsic being. You have the being, and then you have what the being is. So we're going to give some, some examples, and we'll describe this in, in just a moment. Uh, and it, it is impossible to suggest, because of God's absolute unity and his unitary nature, that there is anything other than just God's is is, is is ism, if I can use that made-up word. If, however, the attribute were the essence of the thing of which it is predicated, the attribute would either be either a, one, a tautology, as if you were saying that man is man, or two, the attribute would be a mere explanation of a term, as if you said that man is a rational living being. So we can say whenever we describe God using saying that God is one, God is good, right? So we're essentially defining God by God himself. Um, those types of attributes we can use in reference to God because we're, we're basically saying a tautology, which is just basically we're repeating ourselves. God is one because the ultimate oneness is God. So by, de by declaring God to be one and having the attribute of oneness, we're saying that God is God-like. And so there's nothing wrong with saying that, but once we get into any type of more complex attributes of God, then we will be making a mistake. For being a rational animal is the essence and true reality of man, 
and there does not exist in this case a third notion apart from those of animal and of rational mode that constitutes man. So if you say that man is a rational being, so you're defining man by saying that man is man-like, because there is no such thing as manhood without rationality. In other words, the unique feature of that which defines a human being as being human is that we have the intellect, we have an intellectual capacity. So to say that we are ra- that mankind is rational or that human beings are rational is defining human beings by that which makes them human. So if we define God by that which makes him God, then we are not in error by doing that. But if we try to say that God is merciful, God is benevolent, or God is angry, or God is vengeful, then we are making a mistake. Because those are not definitions that, that are essential to what it means to be God. For man is the being of which life and rationality are predicated. Okay, thus, those attributes merely signify an explanation of a term and nothing else. It is as if you said that the thing denoted by the term man is the thing composed of life and rationality. He's really just elaborating on this point that I was just making. It is then clear that an attribute may be only one of two things. So if we try to, if we want to explain what an attribute is, it would be one of two things. It is either the essence of the thing of which it is predicated, in which case it is an explanation of the term, and that's okay in terms of God. We in this respect do not consider it impossible to predicate such an attribute of God, but do consider it impossible in another respect that shall be made clear. Now, in, a, in the next chapter, the Rambam is going to qualify that even further. But at face value, for the purposes of this chapter, to say that God is one, or to say that God is good, those are terms that are unique to God and help us define what Godness is. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's a second kind of attribute, which is, or the attribute is different from the thing of which it is predicated, being a notion super added to that thing. This would lead to the conclusion that that attribute is an accident belonging to that essence. And by the term accident, what he means to say is that it is not intrinsic or, uh, uh, or uh, essential to the definition of what that being is. In other words, God can still be God and not be vengeful. God can still be God and not be kind. God can still be God and not be a, a whole host of other things that he has described as in Tanakh. And therefore, those attributes which we find in Tanakh, which are non-essential to a definition of God, those are really just metaphors and they have to be explained properly. Now, by, decry- by denying the assertion that terms denoting accidents are attributes of the Creator, one does not deny the notion of accident. There are many things in the physical realm that have attributes. For example, there's nothing wrong with saying that a piece of coal is black. There's an attribute that a piece of coal has. It's color, and the, the color of coal is black. There's nothing wrong with saying that. There are things that are attributes of different physical uh, elements and items that exist within our purview of existence. For every notion super added to an essence is an adjunct to it and does not perfect its essence, and this is the meaning of mikre, or something that is incidental to it. So the fact that coal is black is not essential to the essence of it being coal, because coal could still exist even if it wasn't black. It's just that blackness is something that is an attribute of coal. It is, right? So this should be considered in addition to the circumstances that there would be many etern- eternal things if there were many attributes. And here what the Rambam is, is suggesting is that there's another problem with saying that God has attributes. Not only is there a negation of God's unity by saying that there are things that are additional to God which are sort of part of him, which means that God is comprised of different components because there's God and his attributes. But there's another problem. By saying that God has many attributes, you're saying that these things are existent for all of eternity, just like God. And if that's the case, these are attributes of God that are, um, that are eternal, then you're suggesting that many, many things have existed for all of eternity, which negates uh, the Rambam's uh, sensibilities that the only thing that is eternal is God. And the Rambam is going to elaborate on all of these points as we go on. But he's using logical arguments to demonstrate that God is devoid of attributes. 
For there is no oneness at all except in believing that there is one simple essence in which there is no complexity or multiplication of notions, but one notion only. So that from whatever angle you regard it, and from whatever point of view you consider it, you will find that it is one, not divided or divisible in any way, and by any cause into two notions. And you will not find therein any multiplicity either in the thing as it is outside of the mind, or as it is in the mind, as shall be demonstrated in this treatise. So when we get into a further discussion of ontology versus uh, epistemology, meaning that does the mind accurately reflect things as they are uh, when they are judged externally from the mind, right? That's something that the Rama will get to in the second section of Morin of Uchim. But his point for now is that both within the intellect, the intellect must be able to apprehend the concept of godness as pure unity, just as God exists ontologically or externally from the mind as pure unity, as absolute oneness. In discussing this subject, many people engaged in speculation have ended by saying, now here in this paragraph, what the Rambam is now going to talk about is sometimes the misuse of language in philosophical discussions. And sometimes people, when they enter into philosophical speculations, bend language to an extent where it, it no longer has elasticity. There are certain concepts which, you, which, can I, which cannot coexist. Something cannot be up and down simultaneously. Something cannot be uh, uh, right and wrong simultaneously. And there are certain philosophical truths that cannot coexist within the very same being or the very same idea that is being discussed. And so the Rambam wants to make this point because he's going to say that sometimes people use language inappropriately in trying to discuss the concepts of God and other philosophical principles. Some ended up by saying that his attributes, may he, may he be exalted, are neither his essence nor a thing external to his essence. So in other words, they want to sort of have their cake and eat it too. They want to maneuver in such a way where, yes, God is an absolute unity, and so therefore everything must be intrinsic to God, but at the same time, th his attributes still exist because they're not external to him. So God has attributes, but they're not external to him, and therefore they're neither essential nor, nor are they external. This is similar to what others say, namely that the modes by which term they mean the universals are neither existent nor non-existent, and what the Rambam means over here is our encyclopedia entry number two, Aristotle's theory of universals. I'll just, for the sake of brevity, let me just explain. There's a classical solution to the problem of universals. Now, this was a big machloket, a big dispute between Aristotle and Plato as to whether the concept of universals truly exists outside the mind or not. Now what this means is universals are the characteristics or qualities that ordinary objects or things have in common. They can be identified in the types, properties, or relations observed in the world. For example, imagine there is a bowl of red apples resting on a table. Each apple in that bowl will have many similar qualities, such as their red coloring or redness. They will, sh they will share some degree of the quality of ripeness, depending on their age. They may also be at varying degrees of age, which will affect their color, but they will all share a universal appleness. These qualities are the universals that the apples hold in common. Now, granted, this is not a conventional way of thinking, but this is the ancient philosophical way of thinking. The problem of universals asks three questions. Do universals even exist? Number two, if they exist, where do they exist? And number three, also, if they exist, how do we obtain knowledge of them? So Arist Aristotle departed from Plato in this, in this one respect. Plato felt that there is something, there are some, there's some kind of supernatural realm or metaphysical realm where universals exist. Appleness exists somewhere out there in the ether, and any, every apple connects to the appleness that exists in the ether, and it sort of gets its form from that appleness. However, Aristotle disagreed, and he felt that there's no such thing called um, uh, objective or ontological appleness that's out there in space or some in some metaphysical realm, but rather appleness exists in the mind of either the creator 
or the person who, or anyone else who creates or grows the apple. So, um, so this was a d- dispute between Plato and Aristotle, and there are certain philosophers, says the Rambam, who says that there's no, there's no way, there's a way of reconciling this machloket between Plato and Aristotle because the universals neither exist nor are they non-existent. And that's that's illogical. That just that's a that's a that's a silly kind of statement. It's just it's a it's a statement of absurdity in the view of the Rambam. And again, similar to what others say, that the atom is not in a place but occupies a locality, and that there uh, again having to do with atomist theory. And the Rambam feels that uh, again you can't have your cake and eat it too. Either the atom exists in one spatially confined place. Um, uh, or it doesn't, but you can't say that it uh, occupies a general space without having some specific location, and that there is no act of man, uh, uh, of a man, but that there may be an acquisition of an act by him, and this this now gets into the role of free will, and what he means by this that man, there are those who have argued that man does not have free will because man was born with a deterministic personality which determines everything that he's going to do throughout his life, but man only has the ability to acquire good traits and good morals and ethics over the course of his life, but he doesn't have free will. And so, again, it's a type of, it's a type of uh, linguistic maneuvering to say that man doesn't have free will, but he does have free will at the same time. And the Rambam says that's just an absurdity, and you can't have it both ways. There are things that, these are things that are merely just said by the mouth, and accordingly they subsist only in words, not in the mind. All the more they have no existence outside of the mind, meaning that there's no way to reconcile these things in a plane of existence other than the mind. You might imagine that it's possible to reconcile um, uh, universals as both existing and non-existing, but you've got to choose one uh, in the real world. It just can't happen. Now, before we go any further, I just want to sort of give an, a, a modern thought aside, and that is when you consider quantum physics and, you know, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and the whole concept of, you know, in modern quantum physics, we say that something can both be a wave and a particle, depending upon what, how it's observed, and it's also one of these mind-bending issues where scientists at one point theorized in the early 20th century that it's possible for something to both to be two contradictory things at the same time. It can both be a wave and a particle, depending upon how it's measured and how it's being observed. This, for the Rambam, would be logically impossible. And we would agree with that until it was actually scientifically demonstrated. So again, there's a certain uh, philosophical premise that the Rambam is making here that in that actually may not be accurate. It may be that there are certain things that we can conceive of that are con- contradictory and could, for some strange reason that we haven't figured out, coexist in the real world. But the Rambam says that no, you have to be careful with language and the arguments that you make philosophically because you may end up trying to say something that is ipso facto an absurdity. You can't be up and down at the same time. You cannot be existent and non-existent at the same time. And you can also not say that God has attributes, but those attributes are not external to him. So that's, that's an absurdity. But as you know, and as everyone knows who does not deceive himself, these assertions are defended by means of many words and falsifying parables and are proved correct by shouting defamatory polemics and various complicated kinds of dialectic arguments and sophistries. Should, in other words, people use rhetoric to try to prove their point, even though when you think about it logically, they're still impossible. Just because you you raise your voice doesn't make it true, essentially is what the Rambam is saying, and just because you sound sophisticated does not make an absurd proposition any more accurate. Should, however, the man who proclaims these things and attempts to establish them in the ways indicated reflect upon his belief, he would find nothing but confusion and incapacity. For he wants to make exist something that does not exist, and to create a mean, or sort of like a, a, a middle point, between two contraries that cannot have a middle point. You cannot compromise between up and down, or black and white. There is no middle ground. Either something's on or it's off. Okay, 
Or is there a mean between that which exists and that which does not exist? Or in the case of two things, is there a mean between one of them being identical with the other or being something else? Something cannot be at the same time identical and non-identical. Something cannot be both existent and non-existent at the same time. Okay, what forces him to this is, as we have said, the wish to preserve the conceptions of the imagination and the fact that all existent bodies are always represented to oneself as certain essences. Now, again, here we're talking about God's attributes, and the difficulty with God is that we always think in in three-dimensional physical terms. And everything that we can conceive of in our mind that is physical has attributes. Uh, Everything. Something is square, something has a shape, something has a color, something has a weight, something has dimensions... And therefore, we always think about things in terms of their attributes, because what all that the, all the, we, we've just mentioned, a whole bunch of different attributes. Now, every essence is of necessity endowed with attributes, for we do not ever find an essence of a body that, while existing, is divested of everything and was, is without an attribute. This imagination being pursued, it was thought that God, may he be exalted, is similarly composed of various notions, namely his essence and the notions that are superadded to his essence. Several groups of people pursued the likening of God to other beings and believed him to be a body endowed with attributes. Another group raised themselves above this consequence. And so other, there are other people who said, oh, no, 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 no. God is not a body. God has no corporeal form. Of course not. But preserve the attributes. And that's impossible, says the Rambam. If God has no corporeal essence, then he also must be devoid of any attributes. All this was rendered necessary by their keeping to the external sense of the Nevi'im, of the books of the prophets, which describe God in corporeal terms, which describe God as having attributes, as I shall make clear in later chapters that will deal with these notions, and therefore that's the reason why these other thinkers made a mistake. But the Rambam's point is, don't fall into that trap. If God is non-corporeal, God is absolute unity, then God cannot have any attributes. And to suggest that God is absolute unity and non-corporeal and possessing attributes at the same time, which is what you would want to say to reconcile the words of the prophets to, uh, to, to, in the way that they depict God to, to the way that you want to conclude that God really is, you're going to end up with great confusion. So instead of trying to reconcile the absolute unitary God with the God that you find described by the Nevi'im, instead of saying that both of them are true and both of them can coexist in the same philosophical reality, you're going to have to accept what is philosophically true and you're going to have to view the words of the Nevi'im as purely metaphor, as, the, as just an approximation of God, but not as an accurate depiction of who God really is. And this is, I think, sufficient information for us to actually move on from this chapter, but that's essentially the Rambam's point. So just to, just to, just to round it up, just to finish up, in chapter 50, the Rambam said that language fails us to help us depict God as he truly is. But that, the, but that does not mean that the mind is incapable of conceiving God as he truly is to some, to some degree. Okay? So that even when language fails us, our intellects can transcend the capacity of language. In this chapter, what the Rambam has said, by contrast, is that langu- language sometimes fails us by trying to describe realities that are ipso facto absurd. That there, that there are certain linguistic representations that cannot possibly coexist. Uh, so therefore, in the previous chapter, language fails us because we cannot properly describe God in human terms. But in this chapter, language fails us because it falsely tries to represent God in ways that are self-contradictory in the terms that we use in the language that we are, that we are using to describe God. Okay, I hope you uh, have a wonderful week and we'll see you next time.